Please welcome to the stage your host, Changeling number 32. Hello everybody and welcome to another fan fiction review. I'm of course your host and alongside me is my dear friend, Joel. And we're here to present another installment of the Spiders and Magic franchise. And boy, have we got a great show for you tonight. So I want you all to get comfortable and, and, um... Where is everybody? Oh, um, apparently a lot of people passed on this story. What? Why? I don't know, I guess it was, uh, dark or something, I don't know. Wait, what? Man, what a great time to be Spider-Man. He finally got over his depression, married the ultimate waifu, and can finally, finally hang out with the Human Torch. That is, until he does what every stupid protagonist does and messes with time travel. Now, Peter Parker finds himself in a dystopian future, where everyone he loves is dead, and all those who remain have turned into anime cosplayers and Sonic Boom rejects. Orwell himself could not imagine a more terrifying world. Can Peter save the future and get back home? Or will the changelings claim their ultimate victory? So let's address the elephant in the room. This is a dark story. You know, death, despair, destruction, you know, the whole gamut. But even worse? No shipping. Yes, the trademark ship that made for some great clickbait is notably somewhat absent from this story. Which means, of course, no shipping fluff. And as someone who has criticized the eh, slight overabundance of cute cuddly feels in these stories, I was more than ready for a darker take on the Spiders and Magic series. In fact, this story is actually based on the 2003 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles episode, same as it never was, where Donatello goes into the future and basically everything sucks. Mikey, am I glad to see you? So, it's really you. You came back. Good taste, by the way. That show is my childhood. So, basically, this is a Spider-Man... My Little Pony crossover that rips off an episode of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Just let that sink in for a few moments. I love the internet. One of the biggest changes for this story was our cast of characters. Replacing Peter's regular harem of Twilight, Trixie, and Luna is Sweetie Belle, Applejack, Rainbow Dash, and Pinkie Pie. Initially, I'll admit, this was a little bit disappointing, because all the characters who I was most engaged with previously were now basically benched for this episode, aside from Trixie. However, I do suppose this gives us a chance to really get to know our new cast. So how are they? They're okay, I guess. Though far from terrible, I didn't really connect with these guys as much as I really wanted to. I mean, one of the reasons why I talk about Trixie so much, and why she's my favorite side character, is because her character goes through a lot of change. She has this nice little arc, starting from being a pompous little stuck-up, to being part of the family. And to be honest, it's one of my favorite parts of this series. But when I look at these new characters, well, new, I mean, we've seen them before, but they're never really in the spotlight. I don't really see as much development or any sort of dynamic change as I would like to see. With a few exceptions, of course. You get it close with Pinky with her little learning how to smile again arc, which I actually kind of liked. It was nice and gradual, and I felt it was very appropriate for the character. Sweetie Belle stays pretty constant throughout, playing the commander who can barely keep her things together. But aside from her little crush on Peter, eh, nothing really interesting happened with her. Then we have to talk about AJ and Rainbow Dash. And honestly, I felt like you missed the mark with these two. Allow me to explain. At the beginning of the story, it's established that AJ and Rainbow Dash hate each other because of decisions made in the past. This had me intrigued. These two are the most stubborn of the main six, and both have been shown to be thick as thieves. 
The fact that they have this grudge not only makes sense to me, but it makes for a great conflict. Later, Peter manages to get these two in the same room in order to get them to work with each other. As soon as they see each other though, it gets ugly. April's guys didn't say anything about you being here. Oh, what's the matter, Leo? I remind you how you made us abandon Master Splinter when he needed us most? It's what he wanted, Raph, to save us. If we had gone back there, we would have all been destroyed. We could have saved him! The suspense is terrible. He, he's gonna be the I hope it'll last. He, he, However, before things get out of control, Peter uses his power of motivational speeches and poof, all is solved and all is forgiven. And to be honest, I found this rather anticlimactic. My major problem is that this is the extent of their development throughout the entire story. After this scene, they don't really change or grow as individuals. The Hobbit movies had this same problem. The reason I liked the first movie the most was because it was all about Bilbo and his growth. He starts out as a dainty little hobbit who doesn't want to go on an adventure and finishes as a badass little hobbit. As great as this was, he pretty much stopped growing after that and we had two more movies to go. He had reached his peak way too early, which is why he took a back seat in the last two films. I feel like this is the same problem with AJ and Rainbow Dash. All their development happens in a snap of the fingers and they don't really grow much afterwards. Wait, 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 wait. So you want to pass up on a really cute, adorable makeup scene like this because you like it when they fight? No, I, I just wish their development happened at a more natural pace. Consider this, Peter gets them in the same room and manages to calm them down. He explains to them that we need to work together to get through this or something like that. The two agree, but you can still tell they hate each other's guts. And as we go along, we see signs of this tension. Maybe they don't listen to each other during a fight or they throw petty insults at each other. But, as we continue the story, they slowly work things out. For example, you could have a scene where they sit by the fire and reflect on personal losses. You know, a nice, low-key, but hard-hitting moment. And then, just as they're about to face the enemy for the final time, we have a moment between the two indicating that they've finally forgiven each other, and they can go forth and fight as brothers. Or whatever the female equivalent is. By going this route, the audience would be more invested, and their deaths would be a lot more tragic. Now you might say, well, if you look at the original episode on which this is based, the conflict is resolved very quickly. And while that is true, you have to remember that episode was only 20 minutes long. Time was not a luxury they had. Then we should end by talking about Peter, who probably goes through the biggest change in this entire story. Finally free of his terrible and annoying guilt complexes from the first installment, Peter is now living the good life. And from that point, the only way to go is down. And boy, does he go down. In fact, I would say this whole story is about Peter being beaten down to a pulp, leading to one of the most uh, controversial points in this entire series. And I am of course talking about that one moment when Peter sleeps with future Sweetie Belle. The fuck? I won't lie to you folks, that was incredibly uncomfortable to read. While I can't say I felt it was needed, it does a good job of illustrating how broken Peter was. You see in this story, Peter is put through hell. His wife? Dead. His daughter? Dead. His two best friends? Dead. Despite all of his powers, and despite all of his abilities, Peter can't save any of them. And as he watches all of his death, he becomes broken, barely keeping it together. All hope is lost. There is no reason to rejoice. He has nothing. In that moment, all he wants is comfort. Someone to hold him and make him feel loved. Sweetie Belle knew this. I think this is one thing that some people fail to understand about this moment. This was not some moment of forbidden lust. This was not some moment of romance. This was a moment of desperation. And when he woke up and realized what he had done, Peter finally snapped. 
No longer was he the cool and collected hero. He was a man on a warpath. Somebody would die that day. Whether it be Chrysalis or himself, Peter didn't care. Because he knew in his heart, they both needed to pay for their sins. Wow. That is some heavy shit. Yeah. Speaking of heavy shit. One of the things I love about this series is that, despite its fundamentally stupid premise, is that it always goes for the emotional punch. Happy, sad, dark, the emotions come in all different flavors. This time is no different. Characters die left and right, sob stories are told, flashbacks are had, all in heartbreaking detail, and I love it. For example, I love how Trixie Hey, it's not my fault she gets the best parts. <clears throat> As I was saying, I love how Trixie is portrayed in this story. When we first met her, she was a jerk-off that would blackmail a beloved hero. Now, despite being controlled by the Queen and corrupted by the Alicorn Amulet, she still actively fights it so that she can save her friends. It's so freaking heartbreaking to watch. I bet you loved writing that part, didn't ya? Didn't you, Maximus? You sadistic prick. Thankfully, all this suffering makes the final battle all the more cathartic to witness. I have an army. Oh yeah? Well, we have a moon bear, mother <laughs> Oh man, that felt so good. However, I do have one little complaint. <sighs> of course you do. Now, now hear me out. As I mentioned previously, there is a lot of death in this story. Talk of death, stories of death, and while this is heavy stuff for sure, honestly, it didn't phase me as much as I thought it would. And that's all thanks to three little words. It's only temporary. You see, this story takes place in an alternative future that only exists because Peter disappeared. I assumed, as logic would dictate that when Peter would give back to his own time, this future would cease to exist. So as I read this story, here's what I thought. Oh man, I can't believe Apple Boom died that way. Good thing it's only temporary. What's that? Dinky died? Well, that's a bummer. But it's only temporary. No, not Trixie. She was my favorite. Ah, <sighs> well, I guess I'll have to wait to the fourth one to see her again. It's not so much that you wrote these scenes poorly, it's just that this is a side effect of the story you're trying to tell. In fact, this whole situation reminds me of the Fellowship of the Ring. When Gandalf died, it was kind of sad, but now having watched the entire series, it doesn't hit me as hard because I know he'll return as a freaking badass. His death was only temporary. <laughs> Days of Friendship Past is yet another solid entry for the Spiders and Magic series, containing fast-paced storytelling, over-the-top action sequences, and hard-hitting drama that make it so enjoyable to read. However, the side characters lacked the engaging development they desperately needed, and the premise inadvertently diminished some of the more emotional moments of this story. Overall, this is a must-read for fans of the series, as it sets up for an epic finale featuring a giant ensemble of villains, more Parker family antics, and, probably, a lot more universe jumping. Just as long as Peter doesn't have any more guilt complexes to deal with, I am more than excited for Spiders and Magic 4, The Fall of spider man Meh. Meh. Ugh. Ugh. Meh. <coughs> I don't care what you say, Marvel Soldier, that name still frickin' suck. Bonus round. Spiders and Magic 3.5. The Rise of Spider-Man. In this story, Discord decides he's gonna have a little bit of fun and trades places with his Rule 63 version, Eris, and watches the life of Patricia Parker. So what happens? 
not a lot really. It's a slice of life tale where she fights a dude, has a cute romantic moment with Dusk, and fights even more dudes. The name Rise of the Spider-Man almost comes across as a misnomer, considering half the time is spent with normal Peter. But since I eat slice of life stories like I eat Olive Garden breadsticks, I really can't complain. We get some surprising development from Eris, who thinks Discord's evil plans are going too far, which I actually find interesting. Will we ever see her again? Will we ever see any of the Rule 63 versions ever again? I don't know. Regardless, while I felt more could have been done with the premise, Rise of Spider-Man is a nice little appetizer of a story that feeds the ever-growing hunger for Part 4. Yep, we're done here. See you next time. Oh, <laughs>